here at 2 o'clock for the church. And on the 26th, that's a Saturday, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., or 3 p.m., excuse me, there'll be a church rummage sale. Uh, and the help on Thursday and Friday before uh, is needed to set up and price, and they're going to be doing that. Donations are going to still be accepted. The setup will be in the gym, right? And that's where the right. sale will start. Right, we'll start finishing stuff and yeah. putting the stuff over there and pricing it. Uh, giving opportunity, of course, would be for our Nazarene Compassionate Ministries uh, to ask for donations to help the areas hit by Hurricane Helen, uh, Helene, see and serve for more information. Anyway, there's a search there as well on that. Uh, any other announcements this morning? Any birthdays or anniversaries? Lord Jesus, we ask that you guide, direct, and bless us, that you anoint your word, anoint the music, anoint whatever testimony it might be, anoint this service, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are holy, holy The universe declares your name You see 
right now, and uh, hopefully I'm on. Am I on? Sounds like it. Sound like I'm on? Hello? Oh. It's a green light, Marvin. We got it now. If you didn't get to, well, you didn't get to because I was there most every night, but Marvin just finished a really neat look at the churches in Revelation from the positive side of it instead of the negative side of it. And it takes a balance, and uh, I'm almost inclined, Marvin, to preach that hmm. church series in a, in a summary kind of a thing, because that was really good the other night. Um, and, and as we, <clears throat> in these days in the church, I believe, and I think we can hold to this truth, that the Lord will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. COVID and all of the negativity and things that had happened through all that mess. You don't know what the locusts got into. You don't know what's been tarnished or torn apart. God wants to grant us the opportunity to be renewed. It's better to be renewed. You ever work out and finally one day you realize I'm in shape? I think I remember that a long time ago. Um, it looks like that this fall and I love Thanksgiving because of pumpkin pie and everything else that goes with it. But when I see those leaves change, I know how thankful we are to have what we have and to be where we're at. It looks like I'm going to be coaching at the high school with Scott three years ago. And hopefully I'll be strong enough and everything will go right. And my mind won't go but. If you don't reach out, you'll never know that you got in shape or you got better. So you've got to go ahead. Let's stand together for prayer. And if you have a burden, you're going into the best time of year. Of course, with Jesus, everything is the best time. What's better than spring? What's better than summer? What's better than fall? We get to tell God back, thank you. Thank you. If you have a burden today. I want to tell you God can take that burden, but he's not as concerned about those things that are bothering you as your heart. All of those things are things he could wave his hand and have happen. All the storms could go away with the touch of his hand. He's more concerned about us on our knees, asking for him to guide us and direct us. So it's amazing what God can do, and he's waiting just to have that conversation with us. Just, just to be able to have him be the center part of our lives and see where it takes us. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your watch care over us. And Lord, for everyone that's weighed down, for everyone that's carrying a, a burden, Lord, help them to see that you, you really, you're just waiting to answer their prayer. And it all comes with us being close enough to you to allow you to reach out and just take care of it. Father, for those who are sick, we pray that you would touch their lives, that miracles of healing will take place. Father, even in my own life, to see it right in front of our eyes, to see how someone could be that bad and be restored. And you have the power to touch each one of us. Lord, I don't want cancer to be the God. I want you to be the God and tell cancer what to do. Father, for those who want to be healed, give them the faith to be healed. Give them the treatment to be healed, to allow them to realize that it's about the person next to them, maybe. The person in the hospital, maybe. That it's not always about us. As we lay ourselves out before you, we pray for Doug, and we pray for, for Coral and the kids as they come to, to visit with Angus. And we just pray for Angus and Maxine. Would you just give them a, 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 a touch, super touch? of your spirit, that they might be able to draw back from the situation and see the hand of God at work. We pray for Gary also. And Lord Jesus, continue to work with our kids so that they will become closer to you, that they will be unfettered from this world, that, that we would be able to see things happen. We think of the Nezri household. Would you bless it? Would you allow things to happen there that can only be done by your hand? Lord, we pray for the other homes Thank you for Roxy. Thank you for having her here. What a, what a great time it is when we look over there and she's there. Lord, for everyone that's here, we just pray your blessing upon their lives. And Lord, Marianne and Jose, would you, just, would you just touch them? And I just pray for each one here that they would see God do something, that you would do something in their midst that could only be explained by the renewing of their spirits and their hearts. 
bringing the days of your glory in our lives back. Thank you for your healing. We pray your blessing upon our church. Allow us to move ahead, to move forward, and, and maybe just simply out of truly being thankful, the world would look and say, well, how can that be? Well, it can't be because of you. I pray your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Lord, we ask that you anoint your word. We ask that you do this today, right now. Amen. Isaiah 43, 1 says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. I've shared that story before with you about my mother uh, telling me one time, uh, many years ago, many years ago, that uh, she had, of course, worried about me because I left the rails about 15, 14, 15, and I left the rails. And uh, there was no guidepost for me uh, other than what I wanted to do and when I wanted to do it, basically. And uh, I was the oldest of eight, and of course, at 15, there was still one more to come, but my youngest brother. But uh, it was a hard time for her. And I know it was a hard time for her. And it was hard for her for a variety of reasons. I'm just sharing with you right now. I was that kid who, before I left the rails, I said to my mother, what would be of help to you? And she used like me to rub her feet, which I would rub her feet when we didn't have TV, so you know, what else she going to do? I would listen to the radio or whatever. And probably because she was on her feet cooking and doing stuff all day long. And besides that, she said to me one time, well, if you would prepare one meal a week, I was about, this is, we left Cleveland when I was, the summer I turned 11. I, I, my birthday's in June, so this was before that. And I did. And then I said, I'll cook two meals a week. Cooking two meals a week for a 10-year-old for, we had people who visited us too. <laughs> And one of my aunts who was our favorite. She was only six years older than me. She liked to play games, Marvin. She loved to play Monopoly and Scrabble and Anagrams and old. Hey, she loved it. My mom considered her as a nut, was her younger sister, but she was like a child herself. And so that kid who did well in school, did was in the community, played little, did all those things, went south. And it was a shock to my parents because they really couldn't figure out what had went wrong. It really wasn't them. It was, it was not them. But it took me years to even understand what had happened and then to explain it to them. And the relief was palpable for people in my family because they were all blaming themselves in some ways. Not blaming me, but blaming themselves. And it took a long time for me to get insight. And coincidentally, it wasn't long after that that I got saved. Do you think that God nudges you along 
draws you to a place where you can actually. I sit in church just like you guys sit there. I heard messages all the time. I don't think I ever didn't hear a message. My mom drug us to church. Whether we wanted to go or not. Never heard a single thing they said. Well, I heard all the words, Don. I might have been able to repeat them to you. It's like I can repeat it to my wife when she says, you're not listening to me. And I repeat back what she just said. She says, you're not listening to me. Repeating back what you heard, a parrot can do that without having any effect whatsoever on them. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. My mom shared with me that God told her, don't worry about him anymore. He's mine. Don't worry about him anymore. I'd like to tell you from the time that God told her that, it was just a few minutes before I changed. It was at least... If you wanted to go from 15, it was 18 more years. If you wanted to go from 20, it was 13 more years. Uh, in other words, 33. I'm sure my mom thought at times, I don't know if this prayer is ever going to be answered. What evidence would she have that it would be? She visited me in the county jail after I'd done three years, and she says, hey, What's, what, what? And I says, I could do three more years standing on my head. She says, but why? What's the point? It was some point to me at that time. It made sense to me. I was an outlaw. There's a code among outlaws. It might not be a good one, but there is one. There's a code among lost people. Some proud and insolent about their lostness. They own it. They're actually more passionate about their lostness than some people are about their foundness. That happens to be true. And they're better disciples. They recruit people to their lostness. He is mine. You are also his. Every one of you, and all your children, and everybody you have an influence in, in this life, whether it's a former, your teacher, your students, a coach, somebody you sell houses to, somebody you clean houses for, whatever, you are his and yours are his as well. That's something you can actually count on. Is I have chosen you, you did not choose me, stop calling unclean. That's what I tell this day, a long title, that which I have cleaned. And the Bible speaks about, to Peter particularly, when he says, well, I'm a good Jewish boy, I never ate anything that was unclean. And God's trying to get him to understand that what goes in your mouth isn't what makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth, because what comes out of your mouth is from your heart. And if there's some ugly things in your heart, they're going to come out through your mouth. They're going to come out in your actions. And Jesus was trying to get him to focus on that. Jeremiah says, I was a brand I like to speak, uh, plucked from the fire. He's referencing that scripture. One that burns but does not burn up and out. David said, who am I that you would even notice me? Who am I? Well, God was teaching him as you went along. You're the one that I call by name. You're mine. Yeah. That's the one you are. You were fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together in your mother's womb. You are mine. Know ye that
that you're not your own, that you've been bought and paid for with a price, the scripture says. You've been redeemed, and I've called you by name, summoned you by name. Who am I, you might say, that God would use me? You ever said that? Ever thought of it? Who am I that God would use me? Why me? Well, you did. Moses did. Every single one of them in the Bible did. Yes, they did. Who am I? And you didn't even take notice of me, let alone summon me by name and call me? Who am I? I, before I forget this, it's not even part of my sermon, but it's part of my last sermon about comforting one another. And I think I was talking to somebody, maybe I was talking to somebody, I can't remember who it was right now. doesn't make any difference if it's you. Sorry, I forgot. I wasn't paying attention, okay? But I heard what you said. <laughs> oh, this uh, Gretchen. She says, uh, comfort one another. And I think that a lot of us think, well, I'm just going to stay where I am, and when somebody comes to me and needs comforting, I'm going to comfort them. That's a good thing, because that's where you are. But I'm going to stay where I am, and then when somebody comes, I'm going to comfort them. But actually, I think God says here that he summoned us, and he has sent us so that we might bear fruit. And as we interface with more people, whether it's outlaws or in-laws in your family, whether it's uh, people at work, whether it's people in the community, the people in your church, you expand the amount, of, the size of the audience, so you might actually run into somebody that you can comfort, the scripture says, with the same comfort you have received, it's evangelical comfort. That's kind of uncomfortable, but it's evangelical. I could sit at my home for a long time waiting for somebody to hire me. I've never had that problem. <laughs> but I could try it. But when you go out and start, you talk to somebody. I talked to a professor at college one time. We were just talking. I finally figured out he was head of the probation and parole. I'm an ex-con. He's part of probation and parole. I asked him if I could work for him. He said, yeah. <laughs> And everything else was history. He didn't say, yeah, like that. I asked him, I work for him in work study. For the princely sum of $10 an hour, which I thought was a magnificent sum of money because many years ago, I actually would buy something. Yeah. Hamburg was three pounds for a dollar. I don't know until they get home with me anyway. You could actually buy something with it. He says, I'll tell you what, I don't have the time for it. I'm too busy. So you write up the thing for the county commissioners, if they sign it, I'll hire you. And I did. It was like a paper, <coughs> paper, 20 pages. I didn't, wasn't a typist, so I had to take it someplace to type it for me, because that was before word process. Then I went to him and I said, can I challenge some of these courses? Because I know these courses. I didn't want to sit in college any longer than I had to, because it cost money and time. So I'll tell you the same story. You write them up. Yeah. Dawn, I had to write. Almost like a thesis to show that I had command of the subject matter. People will help you, but sometimes they're busy too, and you need to help yourself or allow God to let you help yourself. And so that idea of going out with this comfort is too. You're, when you expand the amount of people you're with, you find more people that can receive the comfort that you have because you went through that thing but you also find people that can comfort you because they went through the thing you're going through. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. It's about God putting two people together, or three, whatever two or three are gathered together, putting people together to comfort one another. And the more active we are in that, the better chance we have of either side of that equation working, receiving comfort and giving comfort. That wasn't my sermon. But it's a good, it's a good point. Well, she told it to me, and I hate to, I hate to not 
repeat something I heard that I believe is biblical because I will, if I don't write it down, forget it. It'll just get crowded out by everything else later on. Uh, or I'll remember when nobody's around. And I'll speak it again to myself, so that's pretty wonderful. So, yeah, when, when you have some, a nugget of truth that God's given somebody that gave it to you, speak it, give credit. Transitioning to who are you, when you can transition to who you are, and your identity becomes in Christ, you can be like Goliath at that point and say like David did. David go, who am I? And then he says, I am a servant of the living God. And then he says to the enemy, who are you? Instead of cowering in fear or in depression, he says, who are you to defy the armies of the living God? He's basically, you're nobody. Because my identity is as a servant of the living God. I am his. That's why I can call you out. I'm not calling you out. He's calling you out through me. And he's equipping me to defeat you, actually. Before nightfall, you will be dead. And your body will be for the carrion, for the buzzards. When we settle the identity crisis, we confront the enemy. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips, but then God sent a cherub to put a coal on his lips to make him a man of clean lips. As I said, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. When we have an identity in Christ, we are somebody. We are a servant of the living God. We are somebody. Chosen to bear fruit. 1 Corinthians 1, 28-29 says this. I only have two scriptures I marked out here. So I can find it. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not. Things that haven't even happened yet. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Then Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 and I would do it by memory because I think I could, but I think I'll read it instead. Ephesians 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, to bear fruit, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's who we are. That's our identity. We are that people. All praise and glory to Him. Your identity is in Christ. Your identity is in Christ. Because God says that no flesh should glory in His presence. He uses the weak and the despised things of this earth. The things that are not. That sounds like an oxymoron. The things that are not. Those are the things that haven't, don't exist yet. His provision doesn't come until you move until you move into bearing fruit and then God provides. The thing, it wasn't, but now it is. He provides for the journey. Just like he did with Elijah. He says, boy, the journey's too great for you. And then after, but... Kind of like the other night when he, they asked the sons of, you know, the mother was putting part of the apostles, the two apostles, to sit on the right hand and the left, and Jesus says, can you drink from my cup? And they says, yeah, you will. Well, God does this with Elijah. He says, the journey is too great for you. And after he got refreshed, he says, now go. And he gave him three commands to anoint different leaders. Now go. He knew. He knew before it wasn't the time to go. Now it's the time to go. Your identity is in Christ, and it is clean. No longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You've been cleansed, and you're being cleansed by the living God, by Christ himself. And we can look at the Trinity, the person of the Holy Spirit, and all of that, but it's, they work in tandem to prepare you, to equip you, to cleanse you, and to fill you. 
so that you might bear fruit that lasts. That lasts. All praise and glory to God. Once you've made this connection in your mind of who, who you are, who you belong to, it's a short journey to bearing fruit, to doing what God has you for to do. You know, God cares for you. You see, God uses all things. And we know that. We could go through the Romans, you know, God uses all things together for good to those called according to his purpose. We could use all of that, and it's all true. God uses all things, all people to do his work. The weaker, the better. Oh, yeah. The more crushed, the better. Paul says, doesn't it? We were crushed. <laughs> Beyond our ability to endure. We have the sentence of death in our body. The more crushed, the more broken, the more battered you are. Why? So that no flesh. It isn't that God can't share the glory. He wants to share his glory with you. He wants to share his love with you, his provision with you. He's not... He, he doesn't want you to think that it's you that's doing it. Because that's not helpful to you. Satan already did that. One of the, he already did that, took the, took the credit. Because he doesn't want you to take the credit. It's not good for you and it's not good for other people because they know you didn't do it. So that no flesh may glory in his presence. I was uh, at a Mercy Me concert. I hope I can get this right. And uh, there was a guy there. He was probably in his mid-30s. I think he was a Mercy Me musician. Or he became one later. But he was a musician. I know that. And he, and, and he kind of left the rails. And his wife, did a divorce was what was going to happen. Uh, and so on and so forth. And he was kicked out of the band because he was probably drinking too much and not singing intelligibly. <coughs> I probably was a Christian band, or I don't know if it was or not at that time. It's not the issue. His life was falling apart, and his mom and dad were missionaries in Haiti. And he went home, not because he believed in the church, or if he had, he didn't now, or never had, and he didn't. Not because he wanted to be a missionary. He didn't. Because mom and dad had a house. That was... Is, is there a story about like this in the Bible? A guy in the pig pen? And, oh, I'll go home. I'm not going to go home and... You know, I can just be a servant there and be okay because that's, he treats his servants better than I'm getting treated right now. So he went there and on some kind of a Haitian news or something, there was a, something that kind of gripped, you know, when the kid falls down a well or something, everybody's kind of, well, you've seen these in the past, and everybody's trying to get the kid out and the whole village is around and and the news, yeah, it's, it, it's a human interest story. And they're racing against time. And a young girl, 15, she had, there's a latrine, I guess the latrines are about 20 feet deep, concrete, and she had given birth and the baby went into the latrine. And you could blame her, but you know, she might have been raped, she might have been molested, she might have been a lot of things, she was 15. And she could have just let it go and been off the hook. So maybe wore big loose clothes so nobody noticed she was pregnant, whatever. But she told somebody. In a third world country where they still think things like that are a big thing, we don't, we, here we would counsel and give them an abortion. But anyway, I'm sorry. But there it is a big thing. The girl being pregnant. Even if it should be after the guy impregnated her, but that's another she told 
So they went and somebody went down on a rope 20 feet into the thing, wrapped the baby in a cloth like Jeremiah in his arms, and, and, and they brought the baby up. And they unwrapped the baby, and the baby cried out, saying, The baby was alive. This is the guy that's talking here in an interlude. He's, he's, he's with Mercy Me. I think he's a musician or he's with the band. He's something, he's something to do with them. When they started singing, I, I, I listened to Chicago Transit. That's what they call them, Transit. So I played at Ellensburg and Nicholson Pavilion, and I was near the speakers. It's probably like an aircraft carrier kicking off, but now I'm older. This was only four or five years ago, and I'm thinking, good Lord, this music's loud. Does, does all Christian bands do like that? I mean, it should. Took me a while to get used to it. Then they finally got to sit around, like they were sitting back in Tennessee around the fire or whatever, and I thought, oh, this music, I, I can get into this a little better because I can hear it. It's not like it's just rattling you. But anyway, a lot of people receive spiritual help with that, and they receive the Lord. So I'm not not there. I'm just saying, I, I was just wondering, I was going to be deaf when I got done, or deafer. This mother died 10 days later, the girl. And this guy went to Haiti, not because he wanted to. He was just going there because his life fell apart. Drugs, drink, bad life. Wife, I'm out of here. God told them, check out if that girl is available to be adopted. And I guess you can do things like that in Haiti a lot quicker you can do it here. There was no family, it was whatever. He did. No. And one of their partners was a child sponsorship. Like we have in our church, but a child sponsorship. It's, you, you recognize what I told you. I, I actually sponsored. That's not the story. He says, and now I want to introduce you. And the girl who came out was also 15 now. It was a daughter. That girl. So vibrant, so full of life, just radiant. One of those people just lights up a room. Well, you know, she didn't have to say anything. I would say at the Toyota Center, there was probably six, maybe 800 people at the tables, 12, four tables with three at each table that were signing up to sponsor that $40 a month or $480 a year. Uh, yeah. And it took a while, you had to kind of miss when they started playing again. And I figured they probably raised conservatively $100,000 that night for that alone in Kennewick. Who can make the case for orphans better than that girl? Or who can make the case for adopting an orphan better than that guy? Because he is a missionary now. That's pretty much the story. Not because he wanted to, just he was looking for a way out. He left the pig pen and he went home. While he was there, he saw a broadcast of a nation gathered around their sets watching some this this unfold. It was pretty tricky to get down there and get the baby back out and all, you know, whatever. But they did. Rescued from a 20-foot latrine. Uh, where have we heard a story like that before? Joseph? Being put into a well by a 
his brothers discussed what they might do to kill him, how to kill him, and they finally settled on selling him. There is nothing new in the Bible. Because the Bible is written for people that are alive today. And you can say that at any point along the way for the last 2,000 or 6,000 6, years or however the oldest manuscripts so like Job or third, the, the manuscript, not necessarily when you're three or 4,000 years old. It was written for here. So it has to make sense today. It has to hold water today. They said, well, it held water back then in 2200 BC. No, it has to hold water today. God chooses the weak and the despised and the things that are not. And the weaker, the more despised, and the more they're not, the better it is. Because people recognize the footprint of God in that occurrence. There is no new thing. Just old things repeated. Old situations repeated. So we got to meet that person and got to go through that and uh, I, I don't think I will ever forget that. You see, we've heard these stories before over and over, whether it's Abraham and Sarah, as good as dead. As good as dead. See, God uses all things. As I said, the weaker the better. But pastor, I am weak and so giftless. Hallelujah! You're weak and gift. You're a prime candidate for the hand of God and the life of God to use. Praise the Lord! The most gifted among us is a baby in the sight of God. Is weak. You think God's impressed when somebody jumps six feet in the air? seen somebody leap that high in the past. Just wasn't recorded. If I seen a grizzly bear, I might leap six feet in the air. It's possible. Maybe just once. But I'm sure somebody, any, any record you might bring up has been broken at some point in time. The church has spent countless hours and money to discover our spiritual gifts. And little time seeking the gift giver. You see, God uses all things. You are chosen. You are chosen. Jesus says in John 12, 24, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. You're like the talent. God give one or ten or one, I mean, you give the talents, and then the ones who doubled them, and the one who took the talent and just remained one seed, buried it, and that person was cursed for that. You wicked person. You didn't even plant your seed or your gift. You see, God uses all things, and you are chosen. I put this is going to be really popular. Chosen to die. God uses all things. You are chosen to die. There's no 30, there's no 60, there's no hundredfold increase unless you die. Unless we die. To this world. To the things in it. God give the God made all these things buried. He could have just made one food group, which is one thing, and that's what we all ate. He called it manna at one time. He could have made one thing, but he didn't. He made a lot of different things. So peanut butter with whole peanuts in them. He made a lot of different things so you can enjoy them. But we don't worship those things. We're ready to die to those things for the kingdom if it was necessary. 
You're chosen to die. You know, not something that would look like death, but something that is death. Not everything involved in our faith requires us to die. Some things require somebody else to die, and we're recipients of it. And the correct response when we're a recipient of something that somebody else has laid down is thank you. Thank you. Well, what was that song a long time ago? Thank you for giving to the Lord. Thank you for giving to the Lord. You may be the recipient of someone else's faith. Something else, somebody else that laid something down. Not maybe, we are the recipient of others who went before us. Something is laid down so that people in the future might rise up. That's an old story too. I don't want to skip over this, and I think I have it on the next page. When I turn it, I'll see it, but I'm going to sit it now in case I don't. We can look for gifts until the cows come home. Or we can look for the gift giver to enter into our weakness, our notness, and use it for his glory. It's just hard to look in mangers and in tombs and in latrines. In wells where brothers sunk another brother and yet that brother that they sunk in the well ended up feeding that nation. And caused Satan, I uh, Satan, yeah, Pharaoh, Satan, Pharaoh, to actually let him go was enough stuff to establish the nation that is now Israel. Well, there's some bumps along the road and some separations, but it started back there. And the Egyptians funded it. Not wholeheartedly, reluctantly, plague after plague after plague, and they finally just take, take just go, go. You see, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You know, Ezekiel uses this term three times there in different ways. He says, why, O oh Israel, would you choose a gift? God's not against you choosing death. He's against you dying for your own lust, your own self, your own there's a way that seems right to a man or a woman, but in the end it leads to death. That's what he's against. Why would you choose your way? My ways are higher than your ways. My plans are higher than your plans. Why would you choose your way? But God is not saying that he doesn't want something to die in us. He wants everything that's ungodly. That's concerned with the enemy's work and not God's work to be diminished in our life. Why choose death. First, why would we choose death? We were poor, we will defend our worldly life, but we won't defend our spiritual life. That's what he's talking about. You know, to get that increase, there has to be a seed has to die. 1 John 3 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil, of death. Satan cannot see the mystery of the cross. He can look at it. He can't see it. Because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. There's a lot of people in this world. You mean if I, if I decrease, I will actually increase? If I support the work of the Lord, I will actually, that isn't the way you do it, I will actually, my needs will be met. Yeah. They will. That doesn't make any sense to me. You mean I give something and I get more? That isn't the way people think. If I can take more than's mine and do it without going to jail, then I'm 
going to do that. I'm going to take more. Whether it's emotional capital out of the household, whatever it is, I'm going to take more. That's how I am going to be validated. I had guys, and I, I know that I'm going to would call me and say, well, how do I get my wife back? I said, well, stop cheating on her. Stop using up all the money in the house on your own self. If she brought children to the relationship, stop excluding them. If you're really a selfish man, you'd probably honor your wife because then she'd honor you. And then you'd get what you wanted anyway. But then you'd have to actually do it, wouldn't you? And probably more than once because who wants to be honored one day and just the next? I mean, over and over. Exercise your faith. You see, we can look at this and say, uh, you know, God uses all things. And we can take joy in the fact that God can use our weaknesses. Our situation, our station in life. I've never seen a contrast so great as somebody being born in a, in a latrine and then having 100,000 people, I mean $100,000 being, I'm just doing that, 800 times the minimum gift. Blows me away. People will respond to you when God uses your weakness because they'll be convinced that it's not you, it's God. Yeah. They'll respond to it. They really will. And it might take a long time, but <coughs> just, well, I'll just keep doing it anyway because it's the right thing to do and it'll make you feel better and eventually it'll make them feel better. These, in Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40 says this, Yet none of the, them, talking about the people of faith in the 11th chapter, none of them received what had been promised. Verse 40 says, God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And I, I want to draw your attention to that because he's talking about the collaborative work that's been done for lots of years. I used to think, oh, John, that's not very nice. No one of them received what had been promised. Uh, well, they, they, they died and they were drawn a quarter and they, they wandered the earth destitute. Read the 11th chapter, the faith chapter. They had a rough road to hold. But read verse 40. So that only together, them, he's talking about them, only together with us would they be made perfect. God didn't forget that. God hasn't forgotten you because only together with you is somebody that maybe hasn't been born yet if the Lord tarries, or somebody that's already here is going to be the instrument of your perfection. It's not about us entirely. It's about His faith. He's faithful. Faithful is He who called you. And he will do it. You don't have much to offer today. That's great. Just say thank you, God. Because anything that you do through me is going to be you. Thank God for that. Let's stand up. I want to give a benediction and bless us today. I need a blessing. You need a blessing? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's wonderful to see the examples and there, oh, there's so many of them, we could be here forever in the Bible about you entering into the weakness of your people, the lostness of your people, the, the not there yet of your people, the things that are not. 
and to multiply to give a 30, 60 to 100 fold increase. The promise that you have for us. We're not a mighty people, but we are, we have a mighty God. We have a God that can do abundantly above everything that we might think. I has not seen, ear has not heard what God can accomplish. Lord, we need your help. We need your help in our families. We need it personally. I need it. Everyone here needs it. The ones that are not here need it. Everybody needs your help. Help us, Lord. And let us not despise the day of small beginnings. You work through those things. Thank you, Lord. Fishes and loaves, stones. You work through small things. And we remember the small things. We can relate to the small things. We, we are a small person without you. But our identity is in Christ. We're sons and daughters of the living God. Anoint us and we'll give you the praises you do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.